All right. Well, here we are. Uh, I'm Michael Skinner. I am the uh, graduate librarian uh, liaison to the uh, departments of uh, nursing department, health and kinesiology, and the College of Pharmacy. And um, we're going to be talking about scoping and systematic reviews today. Of course, uh, both of these types, both of these genres of, of research literature are not solely um, the preserve of, of health science, but we're going to be, because of my background and my particular skill sets, that's that's kind of the lens we're going to be looking at them from. Um, but they do have wider application. They are used in, in other fields and other disciplines as well. So uh, you can take what uh, what I say and, and, uh, and uh, maybe generalize that. So without further ado, here's what we're going to be talking about. Um, we never know who's going to come to these sessions. So the first thing I, I want to say is that uh, we hope that this will be something for everyone. Um, generally, faculty tends to, to attend these more than, uh, the, than our students, but uh, on the off chance that, that uh, graduate or undergraduate students might, uh, might you know, come uh, to, to this session, we wanted to make sure that we presented uh, things from both the researcher's perspective as well as, as the perspective of somebody who's using it. So we're gonna try and, and offer some explanations in, in the course of this presentation to help make sense of this from the point of view of the user, the consumer, as well as, as uh, the person who's producing a systematic or a scoping review. We'll be going over definitions. We'll talk about similarities and differences between them. Um, We'll talk about, uh, do a comparative review of workflows and uh, talk about uh, indications for uh, both of these types of reviews. And then from there, the floor is open and I will try and answer your questions as best I can. If I don't have an immediate answer, we'll, I'll have to get back to you when, once I've done a bit of research. But without any further preamble, we'll go ahead and get into this. I, I will just say as we go along, um, the shorthand here, SR, of course, stands for systematic review, and SCR stands for scoping review. Um, all right. So systematic reviews and scoping reviews are both very, very common in the literature. You come across them a lot. There seems to be more of them pretty much every decade. They, they seem to increase in number and, and popularity and importance, particularly systematic reviews, uh, you know, given their, their, um, the weight they're given in clinical decision-making. So I thought it would be good to, to begin with the definitions for, for both of these, uh, these concepts. Um, this one, you know, th there are a lot of different definitions of systematic reviews. Most of them are produced by people who are, you know, scholars in methodology or people who are actually doing systematic reviews. Um, I took this one from the MeSH database, and I took it from the MeSH database because the indexers who, who work for, for, for PubMed, um, they're looking at a whole range of literature and, and they have to have a, a guide that's gonna help them make sense of, of and, and decide you know, fairly quickly whether something you know, meets the criteria or not. And this is a particularly succinct definition of a systematic review from, from that vantage point. So I've underlined some things here. Systematic review is a review of primary literature in health and health policy that attempts to identify, appraise, and synthesize all the empirical evidence that meets specified uh, eligibility criteria to answer a given research question. Its conduct uses explicit methods aimed at minimizing bias in order to produce more reliable findings regarding the effects of interventions for prevention, treatment, uh, and rehabilitation that can be used to inform uh, decision making. And of course, Systematic review is, is only part of the, the clinical decision um, uh, toolkit, you know, uh, optimally, you know, it's going to, a systematic review is going to be part of a, a, a meta-analysis, so you'll have that extra statistical component as well, but, but uh, this is what we're looking at, so just to break it down. Systematic review is first of all a review of primary literature, so we're talking about the empirical literature of, of, of research. Um, for an intervention-based systematic review, of course, that's going to be a randomized controlled trial, particularly when we're talking about health and healthcare policy, um, that examines um, all of the empirical evidence. So that's another hallmark of a systematic review. It can't avoid, it can't pick and choose, it can't cherry pick its evidence. It has to look at everything, um, uh, whether the evidence uh, is all on one side or uh, some of it contradicts, you know, the uh, the tendency of, of the evidence overall. 
um, that ha has to look at everything. There are some uh, uh, some types of reviews where that's not a criterion, but with systematic reviews, it has to be an, an exhaustive analysis of, uh, of the empirical evidence. Um, specified eligibility criteria. Um, so there are inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria associated with a systematic review. This isn't necessarily exclusive to systematic reviews. Um, scoping reviews can have inclusion and exclusion criteria as well, but this is usually mapped out in the protocol that is produced prior to uh, the you know, beginning of systematic review. Um, there are explicit methods for uh, minimizing bias. And this is uh, one, of, one of the hallmarks of a systematic review that, that does um, distinguish it from a, a scoping review. Scoping reviews can, um, they can assess the quality of evidence, but, but they don't necessarily have the same, uh, as I understand it, they don't have the same structure and the same um, needs to, to try and, and minimize for bias that, that a systematic review does. Um, and purpose down here, it's used to inform clinical decision making. So I like to think of the difference between a systematic review and a scoping review. If I had to put it down to one um, image, I would put it down to, to, to use a military analogy, the difference between a precision strike and a, and a reconnaissance mission. Systematic review is your precision strike where you have very, very clear uh, goals, clear, obje clear objective and clear criteria of success um, and or failure. Um, by contrast, scoping review is more of a reconnaissance type uh, study. Um, this definition comes to us from the Canadian Institutes of Health, um, and they describe a scoping review as an exploratory project that systematically maps the literature on a topic, identifying key concepts, theories, sources of evidence, and gaps in the research. Um, can serve, you know, with, with, a, with an open-ended definition like that, it can serve a number of different purposes. One of the purposes that, that, uh, that it can serve is to help lay the groundwork for, uh, for other types of reviews, including systematic reviews. But it is more, uh, more open-ended in terms of, of its definition. Um, so what are the similarities between systematic and scoping reviews? Um, according to Munn and Associates from a 2018 study they did, uh, they're both informed by an a priori protocol. Now, I think, I think that particular thing is more aspirational than, than factual um, because an earlier study done, uh, in fact, it may have been the Munn study itself, found that oftentimes, at least for scoping reviews, an a priori protocol is, is not produced prior to, to the, the beginning of the study. With, with systematic reviews, it's, it's fairly common and there are registries where you can, um, uh, you, you can put them in, you, you, you can register them, you can publish your, your, your protocols in advance in scholarly journals. Um, and, and that frequently happens with uh, scoping reviews as well, but I don't know that that's the rule with scoping reviews. Um, both are systematic and often include exhaustive searching for information, and that is in fact the case. Um, both aim to be transparent and reproducible, hence with both methodologies you are expected to um, include your search strategy and, and uh, itemize the, the databases you search, plus any, any limitations, any limiters that you used, so that uh, other researchers, if they want, can go through and, and check to see if, if they also reproduce the same uh, search results using the same methods. Um, both systematic reviews and scoping reviews include steps to reduce error and increase reliability. Error, not bias there. Um, and both ensure that the data is extracted and presented in a structured way. And, uh, and uh, the, the PRISMA uh, uh, group have established uh, standards for, for both types of, of reviews, uh, things to include uh, in, in uh, checklists that, that, that help you make sure that everything is there in, in your reporting for your, your published uh, study. All right, so the differences, I'm sure there are more than just the five that I, I've mentioned here, but these were the ones that stood out for me, the differences between systematic and scoping reviews. Um, they differ in terms of purpose, focus, design, range of literature, and methods, and we'll look at methods uh, in, 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 uh, on a different slide. But in terms of purpose uh, for health, uh, healthcare systematic reviews, especially those that are intervention focused, you know, it's a very clear objective to inform clinical decision making. With uh, scoping reviews, um, 
they're designed to map the current state of literature on a topic and they summarize evidence, identify knowledge gaps and inform future research. Um, the focus of the research question is different for a systematic review and a scoping review. Systematic reviews have a very narrow focus and I'm just gonna see if I can, hang on a second. Let's go back here. I'm gonna have to copy and capture that. And I may have to wrestle with this, so I warn you in advance. Okay, it's not gonna let me do that. Let me just get out of here and I'll go down to the slide and find it. All right, okay. I had four examples, but if it's gonna be difficult, I may just go with two. Oh, uh, you know, let's just go to PubMed and I'll, I'll come up with a fresh one. I, I had the, some examples there I was going to use, but we'll just go to PubMed and, and search real quick. Probably faster that way at this point. Okay, PubMed. And I will use an example from nursing and systematic review. And let's just go protocol. I'm going to hear effectiveness of person, family centered care, transition interventions. Anyone will do this one will do. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a protocol uh, published in uh, the journal Systematic Reviews, um, and this is its structure. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at the the the, the focus of the, uh, the study here. So the aim aim is presented right down at the bottom. Uh, sorry. Okay, so AIM is presented at the end of the background. The aim of this systematic review is to critically analyze the body of evidence regarding the effectiveness of person and family-centered care transition interventions on the quality of care and the experience of patients, okay? So that's really sharp. Um, if we were, to, if we were to, to, to put that on a PICO, it would be very easy to, to find the elements and you know, it, it's a very, very clearly defined objective. And then going further down, um, in the discussion, it talks about, uh, you know, what they hope th this, this information will be used to, uh, to help in terms of clinical outcomes. This systematic review will summarize and present the evidence base for person and family centered care transition interventions. It will also inform further research and will lay the groundwork for more empirical studies on person and family centered care transitions. Okay, so nothing specific in terms of, of an intervention per se there, but, but there is a very specific agenda that they're hoping to, uh, to further by means of this systematic review. Okay, so I'm just going to go PubMed again. Nursing. Scoping review. Okay, evidence characterizing skills, competencies, and policies in advanced uh, practice critical care nursing in Europe. Scoping review protocol. Again, very similar format to the protocol to the one that we were just looking at. And again, at the very bottom, the aim of our scoping review in the introduction, the aim of our scoping review is to identify literature describing skills, competencies, and policies characterizing advanced nursing practice in intensive care across Europe. Um, you know, it, it's succinct, but it, but it is a bit more general. So we're, we're not just talking about, um, as we were with the other one, um, family-centered care transition interventions on quality of care. With this one, we're talking about um, a wider range of, of materials. So literature describing skills, competencies, and policies characterizing advanced nursing practice and intensive care across Europe, but still fairly focused, but a little bit more general. So you can see um, focus is different. Uh, it's a bit more uh, broad with, with a scoping review. Um, in terms of In terms of design, 
Um, scoping re systematic reviews are more analytical. They're designed to to synthesize uh, a, a, a combined effect based upon you know lo looking at at uh, a whole bunch of, of different studies that meet the criteria for inclusion. But they're they're designed to answer the question why. Um, scoping reviews are more descriptive. They describe what is rather than uh, answer the why question. So so um, they ha they have that uh, that difference. And then they have a difference in terms of the range of literature. Systematic reviews uh, tend to be more empirical. They're more research based. They're more concerned with getting at the primary literature. Um, scoping reviews. Um, they admit a wider range of literature. They do look at, at the empirical literature, but they also look at non-research based gray literature. Um, so yeah, wider focus of the literature, um, more descriptive than, than analytical. And, and then there are differences in the methods. And for those of you who are doing scoping reviews, like uh, I know Christine and, and Belinda Deal are currently doing one, I apologize for this workflow. It's not the complete workflow. I, I went through, I, I searched the internet to, to try and find one that had everything that I wanted. My main concern was to show the, the central elements um, rather than the, the nitty gritty and everything. And I think that these examples, they, they're not perfect, but they do, a, a, they do a, a decent job. So I've got an example on this slide, comparative workflow from uh, University Libraries, University of Maryland for a systematic review. And then for a scoping review, I've got an example from University of Texas Libraries. Um, and the steps don't line up, but that's okay. Um, I'll kind of explain as we go along. So with a systematic review, you're supposed to have like, like a protocol design step that's at the very, very beginning. This one doesn't have it, but it has, you know, the, the next part, identify your research question. And at this point, you know, you're, you're asking your question and you're also defining things like, you know, what databases you will search, what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are, and points one and two would, would go into the protocol that will be published. And then once you've done the pre-steps, you search for studies, you know, you do your systematic literature search, and then you save the results, um, presumably in a reference manager, and then you either, you either hand analyze it or you use a product like RAN that, that allows you to, to rapidly um, analyze your studies, select, select studies for inclusion based on predefined criteria, extract data from included studies, um, evaluate the risk of bias included in studies and present the results and assess the quality of evidence and then uh, publish your, your, your work. Um, over here, UT uh, uh, Libraries in Austin gets the, the first step right to develop and register a protocol. Again, though, I think that's more aspirational than, than, than something that's always done. But it, it is something that's recommended. Uh, search the literature. So they're missing the pre-step of defining your, your, your question, uh, identifying the databases, and it, it, defining your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So those things are missing from this one. Select your studies, uh, charts, including uh, sources with two or more reviewers. That's something that's recommended for both types of reviewers. You, you don't want you don't want just a, a, a few people or one person doing the, the review work. The more reviewers, uh, the better, particularly when you're dealing with with a broad literature, as you tend to with scoping reviews. And then report results, implications, and recommendations. Um, there's another slide I think also from okay. So th this one's from Levac uh, at all. It's a simpler version of the scoping review methods. It's the same uh, systematic review steps over here from the University of Maryland, but, but this one's slightly different. Identify the research question, identify relevant studies, uh, select, uh, studies uh, select your studies, chart the data, collate, summarize, and report the results. Um, the key things, the key differences here in terms of the workflow is uh, that there's a step at six for systematic reviews called uh, evaluate the risk of bias in included studies. Um, and there are there are tools that, that, that you can use uh, to do that. that. That's a step that's present in systematic reviews and then assess the quality of evidence. Um, that's a step that, that, that's that's required of a systematic review. Um, and not necessarily a, of a, uh, a scoping review, although you can do it. I think the MUN study talks about the, the, the MUN study lists uh, 
uh, evaluating the quality of evidence is one of the things that you can do in a scoping review. But they actually did a scoping review of scoping reviews and found that, in fact, most scoping reviews don't worry about evaluating the quality of the evidence per se. All right. So um, differences in terms of purpose we talked about. We talked about, um, just want to go back and refresh. Uh, so differences in terms of purpose, focus, design, range, and methods. Um, so when do you use them? When would you use a systematic review? Um, for healthcare, you know, the, one, one of the main uh, criteria is whether or not you, you're, you're hoping to produce a, uh, a study that's going to uh, guide clinical decision making. Um, but if your interest is in uncovering all evidence on the topic, you know, examining all the empirical evidence, then you probably want to go with a systematic review. If you want to confirm current practice, address variations, or identify new practices, then you probably uh, should uh, uh, favor the systematic review. Identify and inform areas of future research or identify and investigate conflicting results. For all those reasons, you would go with a systematic review. For a scoping review, you, you would uh, you would favor a scoping review if you're trying to identify topics for future systematic reviews. Again, getting that back to that reconnaissance component. Um, explore a broad topic and identify gaps in its knowledge and research base. Um, clarify and map key concepts and definitions, clarify working definitions and conceptual boundaries of a topic, discover the types of evidence that are published in a particular field, um, examine emerging evidence when it is still unclear what other more specific questions can be posed and valuably addressed, and examine the conduct of research on a certain topic, like the Munn study did, uh, doing, doing a, a uh, scoping review of scoping reviews. So scoping reviews, uh, I, I, I think, the, the main takeaway for, for me with the scoping review is that it lays the groundwork for future research. If, if nothing else, if you're, if you're in doubt about, about the, uh, the extent and the quality of the literature to support something like a systematic review, a scoping review might be a, a good study to start with, because by the time you're done with that scoping review, you're going to have a clear indication of the kind of evidence that's available and the kind of systematic review or other type of re review you could do. Um, so they, they have a lot of, uh, of application, a lot of, there's just a lot you can do with the scoping review. All right. Okay, so here is a brief bibliography of things for further reading. Um, and I've tried to list some authoritative sources. Uh, Cochrane Collaboration and in, in, uh, in England and JBI in South Australia are, are really, really uh, helpful resources for, for uh, you know, finding out more of, of, about these different types of, of research methodology. Um, of course, the top one, the, the Cochrane Handbook is coming from the Cochrane Collaboration. Everything else is coming from JBI and they just, they, JBI does a wonderful job of, of uh, making available a lot of helpful um, recommendations for, uh, you know, doing these types of, of, of studies and, and reporting them. So there's that. And I see somebody's got something up in chat. So I'm just going to go to the, uh, the question slide here and I'll have a look at that. Okay. Can you please share the resources for further for future reading? Okay. Um, okay. So if the, this this presentation will be up probably within a few hours afterwards. But uh, yeah, if if you like, just um, how do we normally handle this, uh, Christine? Uh oh, is that all you needed? You just need, needed me to put up put up that slide. I'll put it back again. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, and I'll move this out of the way so you can take a screenshot if you like. Uh, and this is far from an exhaustive list. Like I say, the GI, JBI people do a lot. They, they produce uh, a lot of materials. So, um, you know, Munn, uh, Peters, uh, just, you know, uh, all, the, all, all the people on, on, on both of these teams, um, you know, they're, they're, they're leaders in this field and, and they produce a lot, a lot of good material. So, all right. As far as the resources go, Michael, well, I'm sorry, what? I was going to say, as far as sharing that page, we can also put that in the comments on the YouTube channel once we post it there. 
Could, would you mind just t typing that into to the chat? I'm sorry. I, I, I hear this really, really tiny voice. It's like a voice in my, my head almost. Okay, I, I, I guess not. Um, so are there any questions? Okay, we can put this uh, link, uh, we can put a link to this resource in the comments. Okay, okay, sure, sure. That's what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll put the, yeah, we'll, we'll put a link to this information in, in the comments on, on the, uh, the video. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so um, if there are no questions, uh, uh, thank you all for your time. And uh, if I can be of, of uh, any assistance to you, just uh, shoot me an email, michaelskinner at udtyler.edu. And I'll look forward to, to hearing from you and working with you. Thank you so much.